Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. The world's aching. It's crying for hope. It's, listen, hope is, is something that, that political people want. Hope is something that uh, people with careers want. Hope is something that families want. Hope is something that school, schools want. Everyone wants to hope for the best. And so, you know what? I believe that when you follow Jesus Christ, he will begin to make you a person of hope. But I want to I just kind of piggyback on what I started on Ignite. And, uh, and I started this message on, on hope. And uh, honestly, on Ignite, I just never know what I'm going to do. But I kind of went there and, and I really felt like the, the prophetic word, the word that God wants to uh, give is, is hope. But I also believe that God wants to restore hope to people. Not, 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 the, not the society hope. Society's hope is, I hope I get erased. You know what? I hope... I get that girl, that get that guy, you know. I hope, I hope I buy that house, you know, for your, no, that's wishful thinking. That's not the hope I'm talking about. That's not the biblical hope that we're discussing today. And, and it's interesting because as I started thinking about this message, I'm thinking, you know what, God, God is amazing in how he does things because God always shows us this picture. For example, when I was uh, two years of being a Christian, uh, I was in worship, and, and God showed me images of, of lands and properties and buildings, and God said, I'm going to give you those. And, of course, when you first see the pictures, like, oh, my God, that's so awesome. I stopped in the middle of worship, looked at my wife, and I said, oh, my God, God just showed me these buildings and these, these lands and these facilities, and he gave them to me. And she's like, yeah, whatever. Just, and she just kept worshiping. You know, it, it wasn't no big deal, right, because it's something personal. But I really believe that God is just so amazing that he loves to show his people pictures of, of a preferred future. Would you agree to that? Okay, so, so it's kind of like this box of puzzles, right? And so, you know what, this one has five different puzzles, you know, and you look at the, these different locations. Here you have a castle, and then here the, you have the, the North Cascades, and, and then here you have Portland Head Lighthouse, and they're beautiful places. What would you feel if I came to you and I said, hey, guess what, Rachel, I am going to send you to whichever place it lands on. Whoa, you're going right here. You'd go like, yeah. Go nuts, like, yay, and it's all expenses paid for, and we're going to fly you first class, woo. And so that's, that's kind of like what God does to us. Like he shows us this picture of this preferred future, and we're like, yay. But you know what? I think something that we forget to do is, you know, with every picture of a preferred future, we also have to remember that then what God does is this, he does this. <laughs> <laughs> You see, everyone wants the promise, but nobody wants the process, right? <laughs> nobody wants to get down on their knees and pray it through. Nobody wants to get down on their knees and faith it through. And so, you know what? Yes, God gives us pieces to the picture or pieces to your puzzle. So it's not that God withholds the pieces. It's that we're not willing and obedient to get down and grab each piece and start connecting it and work with God so that we can put this preferred picture to become a reality in our future. And by the way, uh, God, since I've been saved for 20 years, and 20 years later, I've been given three properties. This one, Oaxaca. And my mom just gave me land. And so when God says something, he will do it. The question is, will you still have hope? Because the reality is that God shows us a wonderful picture, but then stuff happens. For example, let's just take Abraham. Abraham is, is called out by God. He's in his tent. He's in the desert. He's bored out of his mind. And God says, okay, Abraham, come on out. He says, come out. So Abraham comes out and God says, hey, Abraham, I want you to look up in the, in the sky and I want you to count all the stars in the sky. And I'm sure that he probably started counting all the stars, one, two, three, probably got to 45 and then lost count, right? Just can't count. 
And so he finally got the big picture, like, oh, I can't count, God. That's too many stars. And then God says to Abraham, hey, Abraham, as many as stars are in the sky, he says, I will give them to you as your descendants. In other words, your offspring is going to be so huge. You're going to be a, and we know that Abraham to this day is known as the father of faith and the father of many nations, right? And so here you have Abraham who gets this amazing picture. God brings him out. He shows him a picture and he says, this is what your life is going to be like. But let me tell you something. Just because God promised him this amazing experience and this amazing picture of him being the father of many nations and changing the world literally, uh, he was also dealing with all kinds of circumstances. Overwhelming amount of uh, feelings of probably, you know what, moments of defeat, moments of anxiety, you know, probably, you know, thoughts of just quitting. But he is someone that we hear about in the book of Romans where the disciples now, the early church, is now looking at the model of Abraham and they're wondering, man, how was it that Abraham was able to take the picture that God showed him and bring it to pass because right now we're going through some major stuff in, in our time and, and how are we going to see the promises of God fulfilled? And so Paul begins to speak in Romans uh, chapter, I want you to go, if, you, if you're a, a note taker, uh, on our app are my notes. Go to the app. And so in Romans 14, here's what he says. He says, against all hope. Everybody say against all hope. In other words, all the odds were against Abraham. He said, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. So think about it. Against all hope, Abraham hoped in God. Against all hope, Abraham hoped hoped in God. Against all hope, Mauricio, against every single odd against you, church, against everything against you, Abraham hoped in God. He hoped. He hoped in God. So many times we put too much hope in our circumstances with people. I hope, I hope if you can just change your attitude, I'll be better. <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> If you can just get it together, I would be a lot happier. And so we start having our own description of what hope looks like. Or we put more hope in the paycheck than we do in God Almighty. There's a scripture that says, where does your hope come from? And so here we realize that, that the disciples are like, they're like using Abraham as an example of that man. Man, Abraham was... Full. His journey was filled. Yes, cool picture. Yes, all woo, awesome. But his process, but his path, his journey was full of surprises, circumstances, pain, sufferings, things that were that were probably you know things that we experience as well. And so I started thinking, okay, let me give the church a Abraham uh, hope definition. You guys want an Abraham hope definition? Look at this Abraham hope def definition. It's the favorable. Everybody say favorable. favorable. You know what? I love the word favor. I mean, what if we were the kind of people that just knew that we were favored by God everywhere we go? Like, like what if you were to wake up in the morning and be like, I'm just so favored. <laughs> like, for example, like, you know what? Um, none of my siblings are here, so it's cool to say this, but I'm my mom's favorite. <laughs> I am. They, they, they. They get upset because every time I go to my mom's house, you know, my mom for years, since I was a little kid, my mom served me first all the time. And my sister would be at the table getting all mad at me. She's like, why did, mom, why do you serve him food for how come? And to this day, like, I'll show up in the house. She'll drop everything she's doing for them, sit me at the table, grabs the plate, the food, and she's just like favors me. And what's even worse is that my grandma used to favor me too. And so my siblings, they would hate it. But you know what? I knew my position that every time I walked into my mom's house, my grandma's house, I knew I was favored. No one had to tell me, well, Mauricio, you're so favored. I already know. 
So Abraham, look, the Abraham of his, he's the favorable and confident expectation of something good. When was the last time that you actually woke up in the morning and said, you know what, man, today my expectation is that something good is going to happen for me today. When is the last time that you actually said out of your own lips, something good is going to take, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and you said, oh man, I'm just so stoked. Because you know what, I just, I just know, I just know that something good is going to happen today. Okay, yes, I'm experiencing some circumstances, but I'm, I'm taking a look at my preferred future that God has shown me. And I just believe with all confidence and with divine favor that something good is going to take place this day. I wonder what would happen if we started acting like that. Acting like actual children of God. It's also the capacity to look forward with assurance. Do you have the capacity to look forward? Come on. Do you have the capacity to dream forward? Do you have the capacity to envision yourself in the vision that God wants to give you? Because it takes a capacity of hope. A capacity of hope. And so Abraham, against all hope, Think about it. Against all hope, they're keeping it real. Man, they knew that he was experiencing some serious circumstances. But against everything that came against him, he hoped in God. What if that was the kind of faith that you and I started embracing that no matter what we go through, we hope. We hope in God. We hope in God. In my God, I hope. I, I'm not hoping that my, my, my job is going to give me a raise. No, I hope in God, and God will give me a raise. So many times we lose hope. That's why in the song it says, hope is not lost. But God gives us a responsibility to prophesy, to speak life into our situations, and to begin to experience the fruit of our lips and hopefully the fruit of our lips is, is positive things, that we're speaking life to a dead situation. He said, can these bones live? Huh? He's asking a question. Well, God, don't you see? I'm a mess. Yeah, but God wants to partner with you in building the picture, the preferred picture. So he, when you get down on your knees, he comes with you. When you get up, he gets up. When you're ready to get serious, Boom, he goes and he, and he begins to clear the path for you no matter what you're facing right now. That's what Abraham had to do. He had to go against all hopelessness and hope in God. And that's the reality. Because human nature is to always expect something bad. For example, have you ever been called by your human resource department? Right, you're thinking, oh, dang, I'm getting fired. Oh, my God, they're going to write me up. What did I do? And you just start going in your head like, I wonder what I did. Okay, I, get, I, I didn't cuss today, did I? No, okay, no, I did. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, no, okay, good. And, and we start going. And then you show up to the human resource department, and they're like, hey, we just, just want to tell you what a great job you're doing. Look, here's, here's, a, little, here's a little reward for you. It's like, oh, <laughs> dang. Or how about this one? Have you ever... This happened to me one time. You know, I went to go get my physical. And you know how, you know what, sometimes people can be really weird. You know what, sometimes you just want to find sickness in your body. Some of you just, I know people like that. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go because I need, I'm gonna, there's something wrong with me. So there's, and so we're looking, you know, it's just negative. Just, all right, I'm going to find, gonna, the doctor's going to tell me something wrong with me today. No. And, and, and you know what, I remember one time I, I, got, I, I went to my physical and I had all kinds of blood work. And because I've dealt with cancer and everything to this year, every single year, I go in and they, they do a complete checkup with me, MRIs, CATs, you name it, everything they do to me. But I remember one time the doctor, uh, Dr. Shawan is her name. And, uh, and, she's a, and she's a Jewish lady, by the way. <laughs> it's awesome, Shawan. And... Um, and so she calls and leaves a voicemail at my house because I wasn't home. And she said, hey, Mauricio, uh, hey, do me a favor. When you get home, please give me a call. Well, you know what? Human nature is we go negative. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> right? We start thinking, like, what did she find? And it's like you make the phone call. And it's like, oh, hey, Mauricio, you left your bag here at the office. <laughs> but can we keep it real? Yes. 
did. Let me tell you something. The struggle is not the circumstance. Get over the circumstance. The struggle is your expectation. Your expectation is the issue, not the struggle. You lack this sense of having a confident assurance of expectation for a favorable turnout for your life. And so if we're going to regain hope, then we need to put our expectation back in God. For example, you all came to church today. What was your expectation? Did you have any expectation? Did you come here actually to seek God or did you come here to hear me? I get it. You're here to hear me, right? But where's God in the picture? <laughs> right? Did you come here to sing songs? Like, oh, that's my jam. Woo. Yeah. But where's God in that worship? Do you get what I'm saying? And so against all hope, I hoped in God. Everything coming against me, I still hope in God. When, when people aren't willing to, to roll with me with Jesus, I will still hope in God. When people stop lifting their hands, I have met Christians in this church, every church, where when I first met them, they used to lift their hands, sing, jump, and then they got hooked up with someone, <laughs> married someone, <laughs> hung out with people, and all of a sudden, they no longer worship anymore. They changed. Why? Well, life happens. You change. Are you here today? I love it. Human nature. Listen, hope allows you to make sense out of the chaos in your life. Hope will also allow you to make sense of the painful things in your life. For example, when I went through cancer, listen, I remember there was a moment of my cancer where I looked at my wife and I said, you know what, babe? I said, this is a really tough situation for us. But you know what? I believe that God's going to use this for a testimony and a story and a message for somebody else. This cancer is not for me. It's for someone else. See, how can you look at your situation, at your struggle, at your situation that right now is coming against you and begin to shift your focus back on the hope of this world? His name is Jesus. And against all hope, you're hoping again in God. I'm not hoping that my doctor finds something. I'm hoping that my God can do something for me because my hope is in him. And so, uh, you know what? Hope allows you to make sense of painful things, of hurtful things. Uh, it, it allows you to make sense of bad things happening in your life. You, you'll be the kind of person that, that really, really begins to look from a different perspective and say, okay, this situation is not that great. But you know what? I can see, I can see that God's going to use this to build some character in me. I can see how God's going to use this to, to catapult me. See, sometimes when you feel like you're being stretched back, like you're falling behind, really God is is really just preparing you to catapult you into a new season of great victory. But, but listen, sometimes it looks like this. Man, all the pieces are on the floor, but God's saying, will you get on your knees and will you begin to look, will you begin to work with me? Because faith without works is what? Dead. And so hope has an action to it. And the action is that I have to go against all hope and hope again in God. That is my responsibility. It is my decision. I decide whether or not I'm going to hope in God or not. That's your decision. No one can do that for you. God can't even do that for you. God can't make you believe him. He can't make you serve him. God can't make you follow you. Follow him, I mean. That's, that's your decision. You choose to follow Christ or not. You choose to believe God or not. You choose to trust God or not. It is your own free will. It is your choice. You choose the kind of relationship you're going to have with God. You can have a mediocre relationship if you want with God. You can have a victorious relationship if you want with God. You can have an intimate relationship with God. Or you can have a shaky one with God. It's your choice. It's all based on the decision. That's why he told his disciples, follow me. And I'll make you something. Follow me and I'll make you the hope to this world. Follow me and I will heal your life. Follow me and I will restore everything back to you. Follow me and I will lift you up and you'll have great success in me. Follow me. Look at your neighbor and say, follow him. Hope refuses 
Hope refuses disappointment. Hope refuses negativity. Hope refuses whatever the enemy is throwing. When you don't learn to refuse the negativity that the enemy brings, you're giving him control. You got to know that. Read your Bible. It's in there. The thief comes except to only except to steal, kill, destroy. And Jesus, that was in red, John 10, 10. Then he says, but I came to give you life. That's a decision you're going to have to make. If you're unhappy, that was your choice. But you don't know. Man, they jacked me up. Okay, fine, I get it. People have lied to you. People have lied about you. People have betrayed you. People have done you wrong. Okay, fine. You have no control of people, but you have control of you. Stop letting people put handles on you and move you. Cut the handles off and put your hope back in God. It's like the person that's so bitter of the person who hurt. Yeah, if you're going to clap, go for it. Just do it. Awesome. That was so weird. <laughs> it's like you start. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what pastors do? When they hear a clap, they, they keep going right there. They're like, oh, that was the mother nerve, you know. But I lost my place already, so I wasn't that good. I got to learn how to be like T.D. Jakes. Got to know my moment. Okay, staff, next time have my hanky ready. I got to bust that out and be like, no, but um, what did I say? Oh, yeah, handles. Don't be, don't be handled. <laughs> Nobody likes to be handled. Right? And so let's just take an example here. Here you have Jairus. Jairus is a man who is, uh, he's got great influence. He's got leadership. And um, he's in a really bad circumstance. He comes to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, he comes with hope that Jesus can do him a favor. And the favor was this, because we know that hope is favorable. He said, do me a favor, Jesus. Please come to my house. My daughter's sick. My 12-year-old daughter is sick, and she's at the point of death. And Jesus says, hey, um, sure, let's go. And so as Jesus is going with Jairus, this woman out of nowhere decides to hope in Jesus. And we know that she's known as the woman with the issue of blood. And it's interesting how the number 12 was working on both of these people's behalf. The daughter was 12, and the woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. And for all you deep theologians, what's the number 12 mean? Come on, deep theologians. Okay, figure it out and then let me know at the end. And so... And so what happens is you have, you have now this woman who premeditates her healing. Think about this. Do you know that, that when you operate under biblical hope, you can premeditate the outcome of your hope? And so this woman, if you read the Bible, it says, and she, and she, she said to herself, premeditation, if only I touch the hem of his garment, I know I'm going to be made well. She decided to stop putting her hope because if you read the scriptures, this was one wealthy woman. This woman had some serious money. And for 12 years, the scripture says that she spent all that she had. You have to have some serious money to be spending money on doctors and gurus and psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists and all the, 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 the things that you do to go get help. And so this woman for 12 years, it says that she spent all that she had and then she went broke. And so she came to the place where she said, man, I got nothing left. I've heard about this guy named Jesus. He's walking around. I've heard that he opens blind eyes, that he makes lame people walk. And I've heard that he raises the dead. And she said, I'm going to put my hope in him. And so she premeditates. And then we know the story. She goes straight up matrix style in the midst of all the crowd, goes in, and then goes in for the hem of his garment, just boom. And the Bible says that power left, hope left Jesus. And Jesus stopped and said, who hoped? Who touched me? When you hope, you touch the heart of the Father. Who touched me? 
And the woman said, I'm so sorry I touched you. He said, don't be sorry, girl. <laughs> he, he said, she's, he said to her, your hope made you well. See, because if we really want to get down to hope, let's get down to faith. And we know that in Hebrews 11, it says, and faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things what? Not seen. See, God wants to give you a picture that you can't see right now tangibly, but in the spirit, you hope that it's going to happen. That's faith. That's the hope I'm talking about. And so just imagine this. While this woman is delaying his Savior, <laughs> the one who committed to go to the house, while he's hopeless, he's looking at a hopeful situation. That woman got her stuff, and he's like, yo, I, I, I came to you first, man. You know, probably telling the girl, get in line, girl. What's wrong with you? You know, and so we know that um, as the story follows, and I want to take you to the story there on what happens next. So that just gave you the, kind of like the, 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 the context of the story. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 49, look at this. And so while Jesus was still speaking, it says someone came from the house of Jairus. Everybody say the house of Jairus. See, there's something powerful about you and your house being in agreement. There's something powerful about your house to be a Joshua house. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And so Jairus obviously had some issues in his house. Because some people came from his house and the, to the synagogue leader, which that's what he was. It says, your daughter is dead, he said. Okay, so this dude comes to him and says, hey, listen, your daughter's dead. Don't bother. Everybody say, don't bother. Don't bother. And how many of us sometimes... We, we don't bother with the idea that the outcome of our circumstance is not going to be favorable. Therefore, we abandon hope and we reject faith and not realizing that if you would have just put your hope back in God, then maybe, just maybe, uh, you would see a different outcome to your situation. And so uh, they come to him and say, hey, listen, stop hoping. Stop bothering the teacher. It, it's, it's over. Your daughter's dead. Stop, stop, ex stop your expectation. Don't expect anything out of this. Your daughter is dead. And then I love this because as Jesus is hearing who's talking to you, come on, Jesus is in the conversations that you're in right now. And Jesus, hearing this conversation, he looked at Jairus and he said, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be what? Healed. And so Jesus like, hey, listen, man, I heard what he just told you, but if you just make a decision to put your expectation, if you just make a decision to set your eyes on, and expect God to do something right now. Your daughter is not dead. She's only asleep. And so here's the, here's the reality. You know what? Every single day, you and I, we have feelings. And feelings is a gift from God. But you can't trust your feelings. Because you know what? Today, a lot of you, you felt like going to church. Next week, you may not. I don't feel like going to church. It's too cold. It's f <laughs> funny things. There's no parking. I can't go to church. It takes too long. You know, it's funny how we, we, if we based every single decision on how we felt, you won't get very far. No, you need to learn how to make your feelings catch up with your decisions. Not your decisions based on how you feel. And so, basically, Jairus' feeling a little defeated, disappointed because his daughter's dead. But he couldn't trust what he felt. He had to put his expectation on Jesus. And so Jesus gives him the option. He says, okay, now you decide. You heard what he said and you hear what I say. Which one do you want to listen to? And so he decided to listen to Jesus. And I love this because as in verse 51, it says, and when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except see it's so important that as you and I as we do life you you can't just let anyone in I mean yeah Jesus I mean Jesus understood the power of climate in other words who's your power climate 
Because not everyone is qualified to go in with you on some things. Yes, you can go to lunch with me. You're in. But you can't be in my vision. You can't be in my call. You can't be in whatever it is. You finish the sentence. But not everyone qualifies to go in with you. Jesus understood this, that he only had three guys. That was his power circle. That's Peter, James, and John. And he said that he let no one else come in except Peter, James, and John, and mom and dad and nobody else. Why? Because there was too many negative people in the house. As a matter of fact, it says, and when he got there, um, uh, he did not expect anyone. To, uh, next verse, please, guys, move it, please. Meanwhile, all the people were what? Wailing. In these times, you know what they would do? They would pay people to wail. So this was the tradition of people dying. And I remember uh, Ari used to play the wail. Remember that one, that one skit that was awesome? She did great. <laughs> we did a whole production and anyways. But they used to pay people to wail. Like if someone died, they'd grab a group of people like, okay, here's your money, money, money. And they'd be like, ah, ah. And then, and drama. You know what, today you don't have to pay people to be dramatic. They do it for free, you know. <laughs> and, and so they're, they're all like drama. And, and then Jesus shows up and he says, hey, look, stop your wailing. In other words, stop your whining. You see, here's the deal. Jesus can turn water into wine, but he can't turn a whiner into anything. So he says, zip it. And he says, stop wailing. Jesus said, she is not dead, but what? Next verse. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. When you choose to live a life of hope and faith and love, when it doesn't make sense to this world, they laugh at you. When you are going against all odds, when all hope is against you and you are still trusting, believing, and hoping in God, people will laugh at you. Because they'll tell you, don't you see your reality? And the response is, yes, I see my reality. And the reality is that I hope in my God. Amen. And they laughed at him knowing that she, was a, that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and, and said, my child, get up. And her spirit returned. I pray that the spirit of hope comes back to you and I today. And her spirit returned. See, God is awesome. He returns things to us. So whatever's been lost, he returns it. It's pretty cool. We'll get into that right now. And then it says, and at once she stood up and then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. In other words, come on. Once you hope and you see the victory... Let's get back in the rhythm of life, right? God wants to bring us back to the rhythm of life. Sometimes the delays doesn't mean that God's denied you. It just means that we have some character that God wants to build, okay? And so her parents were astonished, like, oh, my God. But he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. I think Jesus said that stuff on purpose so they can say something. Because how do you not tell people after you've been healed? How do you... But that's my, my question is this, as a follower of Jesus Christ, how do you not share your faith when God has done so much for you? How is that possible? He said, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. You know what, not only does God want to restore hope to you, but God needs to restore hope in you so that you in return can be a hope to others. Last verse, look at this, Zechariah, quickly, Zechariah. Zechariah. Everybody say decide. That's a decision you have to make. Um, Romans 15, 13, before I read Zechariah, says this. May the God of hope, everybody say the God of hope, fill you with all joy. May the God of joy, my God of hope fill you with all joy, all peace as you trust him. See, when you start learning to trust him, then hope is restored. But pastor, it looks bad. Trust him. You see, the problem with trust is simply this. I don't want to forfeit my control. That's, that's the trust issue. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, he is the God of hope. He is not the God of hopelessness. I serve the God of hope. Expectation believes that God of hope will deliver me. Are you hearing me? 
Jairus made a decision to expect that his daughter was not going to die against all hope. Jairus hoped in God. Look at Zechariah. Ever say, God's the author of my hope? He is. If he's the author of your faith, he's the author of your hope. Zechariah, look at this, 9-12. It says, return to the stronghold. This is pretty powerful. Because strongholds are normally known as something negative. You know what? When you talk about stronghold, people say things like, you know what? They have the stronghold of lust, the stronghold of anger, the stronghold of anxiety, the stronghold of pain, the stronghold of depression, whatever it is. And so there's different strongholds, but in this context, in this phrase that Zechariah is bringing, it's not, it's not a negative one. It's actually a positive one. If you read the original of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 12, it really means that word stronghold. In, in the Hebrew, it means strength. So Zechariah is prophetically speaking to the people. He's saying, return to your strength. Who's my strength? Jesus, right? I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, okay? And so he's saying, return to your strength. Return to Jesus. Some of us, we believe in Jesus. So we, we in our mind, I believe in Jesus. But there's a gap between your mind and your heart. And the only one that can connect those is the Holy Spirit. No one else. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. That's pretty, that's like, that's like basically, that's like prisoner of hope. I just think ball and chain because a stronghold is basically something that tries to hold me back. But in this situation, he's saying, <laughs> return to your strength, you prisoner of hope. That means that in any and every circumstance or situation, you can come in with hope. Why? Because I'm a prisoner of hope. That means the only bondage I have is hope. The only thing that controls my life is hope. The only thing that speaks to my life is hope. The only thing I think in my life is hope. The only thing I see with my eyes is hope. So he says to us, return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today, ever say today. He says, I declare that I will restore double to you. And so here's the truth. When you choose, when you decide, when you decide to expect your, your life and your heart and your mind to set your hope in my God, then you begin to experience the things that you lost. God will give you double of what you've lost. Why? Because when I'm his prisoner, man, there's benefits with him good benefits. I want to have the stronghold of his word. I want to have the stronghold of his peace. I want to have the stronghold of his joy. I want the stronghold of his faith. And that is only created by hope. I'm a prisoner of hope. It's a whole other way to see it, huh? So stop saying I'm in bondage to fear. I think we like to talk so much about our bondages because we've learned to coexist with them. And we're ball and chain with the bondage of negativity instead of being in ball and chain with the bondage of hope. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.